Shalom, I'm Lisa Rappaport. I'm the rabbinic intern at Netivot Shalom and a rabbinic student in the Olive program. And at Netivot Shalom, we are on day 31 of 40 days of lifting Torah, which has been one of the ways our community has responded to a very impactful incident that happened a few weeks ago when our Torah fell off of its stand during a Shabbat morning service. And I and several members of our community have been offering daily teachings as a way to raise Torah up and to bring more Torah learning into our community and hopefully beyond our community. For me personally, over these 40 days and hopefully beyond the 40 days, I've been delving into Pirkei Avot, the sayings of our fathers. Pirkei Avot is a tractate of the Mishnah that focuses on ethics and interpersonal relationships and it actually has little or no halakha, which is Jewish law. My goal has been to study one of these compact and very potent teachings each day, using it as a focal point, something to meditate on throughout the day. It's been a really great practice, and it's something I recommend to anybody who's looking for a way to bring a little bit of Torah into their life each day. So I'd like to offer some reflections for today's 40 Days of Lifting Torah. Many of the teachings in chapter one of Pirkei Avot, I'm still focusing on chapter one of the six chapters, addresses the issue of speech, of speaking, of silence, and being quiet. There's a lot we can learn from our sages about how to use our voices appropriately, how to use them respectfully, proactively, when to shout from the mountaintop, and on the other hand, when to err on the side of silence. So I want to share some of the examples from this first chapter of a vote that focus on speech and conversation. And I'm going to share them chronologically in the order in which they appear to see if there's something that we can learn from their progression. I'm not actually focusing in depth on the progression in my own reflections today, but perhaps some of you out there will find the wisdom inherent in the progression. So from a vote one five, Yose ben Yochanan of Jerusalem taught, Open wide the doors of your home and make the poor welcome as members of your household. Do not engage in small talk with your wife. Now, if this be true for one's wife, how much more so does it apply to the wife of a friend? Our sages derived a lesson from this. One who engages in small talk with his wife harms himself. He will neglect the study of Torah and in the end, inherit Gehenna. So before I continue, I just want to recognize that this Mishnah is one with challenging ideas around language and gender. Some commentaries suggest that this may be the single most derogatory statement about women in the entire Torah. And what I think is interesting is to look at this Mishnah juxtaposed to the others about speech, and then ultimately try to extract the essential teaching that's relevant for modern readers. So moving on, a vote one nine. Shimon ben Shittach taught, cross-examine the witness thoroughly, but be careful in your choice of words, lest something you say lead them to testify falsely. A vote one eleven. Avtogon taught, sages, be careful of what you say, lest you be exiled by the authorities. You may be exiled to a center of heretical sects, and your students who will follow you there may imbibe their teachings and become apostates. You will thus be responsible for the desecration of God's name. In a vote 115, we read, Shammai taught, make the study of Torah your primary occupation. Say little, do much, and greet every person with a cheerful face. And finally, in a vote 117, there is a similar sentiment. Shimon taught, throughout my life, I was raised among the scholars, and I discovered that nothing becomes a person more than silence. Not study, but doing meets vote or deeds is the essence of virtue. Excess in speech leads to sin. So each one of these teachings hone in on something slightly different, but the overarching theme is that we need to cultivate a discipline, an inner knowing of when to speak, what to say, and to whom to say it. So at a time when I feel like it's difficult for us to keep quiet, when in fact there is an imperative for us to speak up, to speak out with clarity and conviction and with strength, how are we to understand these teachings? In fact, two of these teachings explicitly urge us to err on the side of silence. 
quote, there is nothing better for the body than silence. One who speaks excessively brings on sin. Say little and do much. What we learn, I think, is to deeply consider what we say. In thinking of our own use of excessive speech, can we trim all the fat, all the extraneous, extraneous chatter, so that we can deliver a lean but potent message to those who need to hear it? Oftentimes, the truest, purest message is buried in a pile of words that are irrelevant, or maybe they're mean, or barbed in such a way that the important message that needs to be heard falls on deaf or resistant ears. But we're in interesting times and the need to speak up has become urgent and imperative. Can this wisdom of cultivating silence be of any help? I think one of the recent, I, I can think of one recent and very powerful example. Our sages urge us in a vote 115 to say little and do much. And the women's march that recently happened was an interesting example of this. On that day, people all over the world were doing, and they were doing it in astonishing numbers. Had this march never happened, had it never been on the calendar, all those millions of people undoubtedly would have spent that time at home with friends, with family, with many of us fretting and whining and despairing and yelling. But instead, for those few hours, we put aside, we put the talking aside and we used our feet and our bodies to say and express something with very little words. And much of the words shared were not spoken. This was also a time for people to crystallize what they wanted to say in a few well-chosen and important words that they could fit on to a poster board. I was so taken with seeing well-crafted, succinct messages in writing being held by bodies in motion, thousands of bodies moving, marching, not uttering a single word, but conveying so very much. And of the hundreds of signs I saw that day, I found one particularly interesting. It said something like, it's so bad even introverts are out. Again, no actual words spoken and a few simple words written on a sign. But what this conveyed to the world is that for even people who don't like to be seen, for the people who don't want to engage in conversation, for the people who can't tolerate crowds, they were so moved to action that they too were here on the march. The introverts were speaking up. Maybe what our sages are telling us is that when we are involved in excessive speech, when we're ranting and rattling on, not much is getting done in the way of tikkun olam and repair of the world. As the text says, the essential thing is not study or speech, but deed. But then there are times when I think the action that is needed is actually to speak, is to talk, is to orate and to get others involved in conversation. So how are we to know the difference between excessive speech, which may not be needed, and imperative speech, which is needed? I think we can look to another very famous Mishnah in this chapter. In the words of Hillel, if I am not for myself, who is for me? And if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? The key quest question in those words is, if not now, when? I think we all know that now is the time. It's clear that not only are our voices needed in all the ways that we use them, praying and singing and shouting and informing and calling and educating, but our actions are needed too. Our liturgy tells us that God spoke and the world came into being. From this, we understand the power of speech. With words, we create. May we come to understand the importance of this so that we can use our words to create the world in which we want to live.